So I'm sitting in a tiny exam room at the doctor's office for a routine visit. Separate and apart from the paralysis which put me in this wheelchair, I have a rare blood disease. It's called essential thrombocythemia. I produce too many platelets, so my blood is too thick. Now for the last 18 years, I go to the doctor's office every three months or so, and they do the blood check, and they give me, and adjust my meds, and so on it goes. Well, my current doctor, I don't really like him very much. I call him Dr. Doom. <laughs> <laughs> Every time, you know, he's tall, gaunt, and gray. You know, like gray hair, gray skin, gray teeth. He's like the human embodiment of cancer, and he just creeps me out. <laughs> and every time I see him, he, he just depresses the hell out of me. You know, I go in, bop in, just go to the doctor's appointment, and then he says something like, well, I just finished reading a journal article about the drug you've been on for the last 15 years, and apparently it causes your disease to become cancer. <laughs> I'm like, oh, great. So I, I hardly see this guy if I can get away with it. But here I am, it's been a year, and uh, Dr. Doom does not disappoint. <laughs> he comes in and says, uh, yes, well, uh, Anne, I've been reviewing your medical test we did recently, and um, it seems your disease has progressed into myelofibrosis. This means your bone marrow is scarring over, and you are not producing enough blood cells to support life. I predict you have one to two years to live. What? I don't believe it. This is Dr. Doom. I've had this disease for 18 years, and I don't feel sick. I'm tired all the time, but I am not sick. I am getting a second opinion. So I go to Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and I see the nation's expert in my illness. And he says, Anne, I have reviewed your files, and I have to confirm the diagnosis of myelofibrosis. We don't know what causes it. We don't know how to cure it. Wow, it's true. I'm dying. My body feels heavy, like I'm sinking. But I do think, just by looking at you and your records, that you're going to live longer than one to two years. I give you a 75% chance of living five years and a 25% chance of living 10 years. I'm relieved, even happy. I mean, this is five times what Dr. Doom said, <laughs> but a million thoughts flood my mind like, should I keep working? Will I do if I quit? Who will I be? What kind of memorial service do I want to have? Not that I'll be there, but you know, you have to think about these things. And oh, I don't have a will. And on and on it goes. So I quit my job, I do a will, and I sign up for an experimental drug program. And as the days become weeks, I realize, you know what? All of these tasks are to just keep me busy so I can ignore the big issue. I'm afraid of dying. I get it, we're all gonna be dead. You know, there's no way out of the pine condo, turning stiff, juggling halos, okay, I got that. But I don't know how to die. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to behave. No one has ever told me because we don't talk about it. So I Google the do's and don'ts of dying. <laughs> I get a lot of information on how to really dye hair expertly. <laughs> <laughs> I scroll down a little bit farther, and I find five things you can do for a loved one who's dying. Ethical end-of-life tips for healthcare professionals. Uh, ads for hospice with pictures of happy, smiling people, which seems a little antithetical. <laughs> oh, and I found the Farmer's Almanac had 100 ways to avoid death. Number two, never put a broom on top of a bed. <laughs> Number 52. Do not let two people comb your hair at the same time. <laughs> and my favorite, don't even think of mocking an owl. <laughs> Who? <laughs> well, then a friend of mine told me about POA, P-O-W-A. POA is the Buddhist practice of conscious dying. So I find a class at a Buddhist retreat in the hills outside of Charlottesville, Virginia. And it says in this class, students will learn how to accept death as a natural and expected process. Students will learn how to adopt an appropriate attitude in preparation for death. And they will learn how to practice POA at the time of death. I'm like, this is it. Well, at the end of a long, twisty, turny road, I arrive at Serenity Ridge. 
The driveway is marked with tall, long flags and yellow, red, and blue snapping in the wind. I don't know what I expected, but it's a plain, small compound spread out on a sloping hillside. I get out of the car, and I'm struck by how quiet it is. How beautiful, with rolling hills and trees in the distance. My room is in a new L-shaped complex on the property, and the temple is part of that. And from the outside, the temple looks very nondescript, even prefab. But when you go inside, oh, it bursts with color. Saffron, royal blue, brick red. And I meet the other students that are there. They're all very dedicated, long practicing Buddhists. I'm the only one there with an immediate need for this information. <laughs> <laughs> I wake up the next morning to the sound of Tibetan longhorns playing. They issue a deep, foggy sound that rolls over the hillsides. Practice begins at 7 a.m. outside, and it's October and cold. <laughs> Mist still shrouds the trees. Our teacher begins the practice by leading chanting in, chant in Sanskrit to invoke the gods. Our combined voices create a pleasant vibration I feel throughout my whole body. I'm not a very religious person, so part of me finds these rituals and deities and practices bizarre, but it doesn't stop me from enjoying the pleasant rhythm of the five days. Up here, there are no cell phones, no TV, no Wi-Fi. But there's our, there are drums and bells, flowers and incense, and butter sculptures. All the senses are engaged. Up here, there is only nature and ourselves and our understanding of our own nature. Our teacher tells us, the approach of death is a time for reconciliation and reckoning, before giving and being forgiven, we fully prepare ourselves for the journey through death. And I think, well, that sounds familiar because when my mother went into hospice, the doctors emphasized to us the most important thing at this time was to give and ask for forgiveness. The teacher continues, it is our feelings of being unforgiven and unforgivable that make us suffer. But these feelings only exist in our hearts and minds. Forgiveness already exists in the nature of God. It is already there. I think, wow, that is so powerful. The fact that I create my own suffering means I can stop my own suffering. And even if I can't, forgiveness is already waiting for me. At the moment of death, let go of grasping, yearning, and attachments. It is time to let go of our of things, loved ones, and our bodies. We can take nothing with us on this journey. And I realized in that moment, my fear of dying is grasping. I don't want to give up living. I am attached to my loved ones and my body. I don't know anything else. But I am beginning to understand that I am more than my body, that I, what illuminates me transcends my body. Our last thought and emotion before we depart is extremely important. Pray to protect, nurture, and help others. To die with such loving tenderness and compassion in our hearts until our last breath is a good death. Yes, this I can do. Rather than lying around and being afraid about what will happen, as my final act, I will love those who are dearest to me, even as I let them go. As I drive away from Serenity Ridge, I am happier, less fearful, more peaceful than I have been since I sat in Dr. Doom's office and he told me I was going to die. I'm in my sixth year now, my 10-year window, and I'm doing great. I've learned to incorporate what I learned about how to die into how I live. I'm more forgiving with myself and others. I am more aware of my attachments and I let go of things more easily. And I figured out, I don't have to wait till I'm dying to be more compassionate. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd still, I don't know how my death will unfold or when it will come, but I do know what to do when it does. <laughs>